Japanese service book. They just kind of, uh -huh. they couldn't believe it because they couldn't speak Japanese. They knew they couldn't speak Japanese, but here they're reading the Shoshinke from the original uh, kind of text. So it is possible. And so what we're going to do today is uh, uh, kind of introduce this, and you're going to learn at least five Chinese characters, how to write and read, read them uh, by the end of this, this afternoon, okay? So uh, before we go into that, though, I want to share something that I learned from uh, my teacher at uh, Ryukoku University, Professor Shigaragi, and that's two terms. One is called gudo, gudo, and it's written this way. So this is to seek, and this is the path, or the way. So we have to have, in a sense, the spirit of, of really seeking and uh, listening and learning uh, the path of Buddhism. It's not just going to be handed to you on a silver platter. You have to put forth effort and you have to seek the path. But once you come to seek the path and come to appreciate the teachings, then, then, everyone, we, we all have, uh, So after seeking and coming to receive the teachings, then we can share the teachings. So dendo is called to transmit the path, transmit the way. But without seeking, we cannot transmit the teachings. It's like uh, you know, being a Dharma school teacher even. Uh, if we don't have some kind of understanding of, of the Dharma, then what are we going to be able to share to our, to our students as Dharma school students? And as a minister, we have to study first. We have to go deep into the teachings to be able to, to share the teachings you know, as a minister. So Sensei was always emphasizing that you have to have both. They're like the pistons of an engine. You know, pistons go like this. One goes down, one goes up, and they work together. So uh, you can't have this without this. And he pointed out, you know, in our Honganji, we have a dendo yin, like an institute on propagation, but we have no institute on <laughs> seeking the path. And he felt that that was kind of, that's kind of wrong, that we should have both. If we're going to have this, we should definitely have, have this as well. So, you know, Buddhist education means we're, we're, we're going deeper into the teachings, we're going to uh, put forth the effort to come to a seminar, to take a class for four weeks or eight weeks, or to read some books, and to discuss it with others, and to learn and listen. So that's the importance of gudo, and we have to have gudo and, and then dendo. Okay? Okay. So, then uh, I talked about how we, the way we studied it, we, we learned how to write the Shoshinge. But before we had our class, every, every session, we would chant the Shoshinge. So, I, you know, we quite don't have time for that in our seminar today, but uh, if we were going to do this over uh, so many weeks, I would have us do that. We would chant the Shoshinge first, and then we would uh, study it, and then we would practice writing it. So that you're learning it through body, speech, and mind, through all faculties, see? So you're chanting it, you're chanting it, your mouth is saying it, you're hearing it, and then you're reading it, and learning, and then mentally thinking about, okay, this character means this, and this line means this, we're thinking about it, and, and then you're actually, even through your own body, you're learning how to write the character, so that each character has meaning for you, kind of in terms of, uh, so body, speech, and mind. So that's what we did for, <laughs> for three years or so in studying this, uh, this Shoshinge, okay? Okay, so... Oh, yes. So, let's start and uh, let's start by, uh, let me introduce uh, what are called these Chinese characters. And in Japan, uh, they're called kanji. 
So Japan learned its writing system from China. But then the Japanese couldn't pronounce the Chinese characters like the Chinese do. So they came up with their own pronunciation. So when we're chanting, oh thank you, when we're chanting the Shoshinge, it's actually Chinese, but with the way a Japanese person can pronounce it. So a Chinese person would look at that Shoshinge and be able to read some of the characters. Of course, if you don't understand Buddhism, you know, you may not be able to read it well, but at least they would recognize the characters, but they wouldn't pronounce it in the way that, that the, the Japanese Shin Buddhists would, okay? So, so first we have to have an understanding of, of these Chinese characters. So how many of you went to Japanese school when you were younger? And some of you? Okay, okay. And so I'm sure you enjoyed Japanese school when you were younger. <laughs> so we're going to kind of go back to elementary school and how uh, a, a young student in Japan would first be introduced to writing these Chinese characters. So in Japan, they have a couple of different writing systems. One is called hiragana, which is kind of an alphabet kind of a system. And then they also have these kanji, uh, where you have to learn these Chinese characters. Just to be <coughs> literate in Japan, like to where you could read the newspaper, uh, junior high school level education, like after about eighth grade or so, you have to learn about 1,800 of these Chinese characters. Then by the time you get through high school, and college, you, you, you have to know at least about 3,000 of these characters. And in China, because they don't have this alphabet system like Japan has, they, you know, they're, they're learning even more than 3,000 characters. So, so, these characters start from kind of a pictogram. Pictogram. So, I'm not a very good artist, but let's say you have uh, mountains. <laughs> what mountains do we have here next to you? Are you Ogden? I don't know. <laughs> so, so to depict mountains, they develop this character. So this is a character for mountain. Okay. So it's just three strokes. One, two, three. Okay. I uh, I know you don't have. Uh, practice paper there, but just practice writing it in the air. So just follow along as I, I do it. So one, two, three. So the stroke order is important because the stroke order helps us remember the character too. So one, two, three. One, two, three. So if you were in, in first grade or second grade in Japan, you would learn this character, then your homework assignment would be, you know, you got to go home and write it maybe 20 times, okay? So uh, this is the, one of the first characters that they learn. Mountain, okay? <laughs> what, what does that look like? River. River, very good, river. I did this, my daughter school kids go, looks like tread tire. <laughs> Oh, tire tread, tire tread, tire tread. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's how you write river, okay? So just three strokes, one, and it curves, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then this one's shorter than these two. So that's how you write river, and you can see it comes from a picture of a river. Okay. Uh, if you go to Japan, these these two characters you should at least be able to read. Anyone know this one? This is a woman. That's man. That's woman, man. So when I went to Japan, they didn't always have English written on the bathroom signs, you know, the doors. So at least you have, you have to know these two characters, otherwise you're going to walk into the wrong, <laughs> wrong bathroom. And then sometimes a bathroom door would have both characters on it. And so well, what does that mean? So it's either men or women can go in, and then I guess there's a lock on the door. So if this character means women, if this character means women, 
What do you think that character means? Three women. Three women. What do you think that one might mean? Harem. Harem? No, it doesn't mean harem. Shopping? No, it doesn't mean shopping. Yes, yes. Noisy. This is how you write. Noisy. It's not polygamous. What's the stroke order in that? Oh. One, two, three. Oh. One, two, three. To make up for the, put the house for peace. Show them what peace is. On. Oh, okay. So you don't make it sound like women or something. Yeah, that's good. That's good. This is, this is a way of writing peace. So literally, woman, in the home. <laughs> oh. Meaning. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, you were saying that the kanji is from China. Yes. So when you're showing, is it the one the Japanese? It's both. It's both, yeah. So the Japan learned its writing system from China, so they take these Chinese characters, just uh, they learned it exactly from China. So it would, this would also mean women in. Chinese. Either in Chinese oh. or Japanese. Okay, so, uh, yeah. so, so I, I should be fair to the women. So if this means noisy, three women. <laughs> what do you think that character? Four men. What do you think that character means? Right now. War. War. <laughs> <laughs> Wisdom, wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> this, means, this means golf in Chinese. <laughs> or so. No, actually, actually, this is a joke. I make this character up myself. <laughs> so don't look this up in the Chinese. <laughs> but these Chinese Chinese characters, it could be it could be a lot of fun, you know. Like uh, working on the, what's that, that math thing that people like to do? Sudoku. Sudoku, you know. My wife likes to do Sudoku, but really these Chinese characters could be, could be really kind of a lot of fun. So, uh, so you know, it starts from some kind of a picture, and then it, and then it evolves. And you have to know the stroke order, uh, which helps you to remember it. Okay, so now let's uh, let me just talk about the Shoshinge and where it appears within Shinran Shonin's lengthy work. So he wrote a lengthy. His main work is called the Kyo Gyo Shinsho. It's uh, uh, it's actually this is an abbreviation. But the full title of the Kyokyo Shinsho is a collected a collection of passages. Collection a collection of the the full title that uh, well the teaching. Uh, the teaching, the true teaching practice and realization of the Pure Land way, but it's called, often called Kyogyo Shinsho for short, and it consists of six chapters, six chapters, and the Shoshinge appears at the end, at the end of the second chapter, okay. Second chapter. So the first four chapters are on teaching. What is the true teaching? What is the true practice? What is the true uh, Shin Jin, which is a unique term to Shin Buddhism, sometimes translated as faith, but maybe better if we just keep it as Shin Jin, and uh, uh, enlightenment or realization. These are the first four chapters, and then there's a fifth chapter on the true Buddha and land, 
and the sixth chapter on the transformed Buddha and land. But for now, let, let's just kind of keep these first four chapters in mind. And the Kyo, uh, Shoshinge is this poem or song of 120 lines, and it appears at the end of this chapter, on, chapter two on practice, okay? So, and the end of chapter two on practice, appears this uh, Shou Shinge. Okay? So, just remember that it, it's, it wasn't a work in itself, but it's a work that appears within this long, longer text called the Kyogyo Shinsha. Okay. Okay, now this is a good time to just take a little break and refill your tea or coffee or something. And then when we come back, we'll start learning the characters of the title. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get started again. Uh, so before we go into actual, the actual title, I just want to say a little bit about what this uh, Shoshinge is. So Shinran Shoshinge, of course, in this lengthy uh, Kyogyo Shinsho, is relating uh, what he understands the Buddhism to be. But he really expresses it in a, in a more of an abbreviated form in these 120 lines. He expresses his own uh, deep spiritual understanding, his Shinji, his true-hearted mind that he has come to receive uh, through the wonderful teachers and teachings uh, that he has uh, come to encounter. And so in the Shoshinge, he praises the sort of the source of his insight, which is, of course, going back to Shakyamuni Buddha, and then the larger sutra uh, that the Shakyamuni Buddha expounded on, and it's through the larger sutra that he came to uh, sort of encounter what is what I call timeless Buddha, or Amida Buddha, as expressed in this larger sutra. And then he goes on to uh, praise the seven masters in the Buddhist tradition that he feels brought Buddhism to him. So there are two in India, three in China, and two in Japan. So through these seven masters, Buddhism came from Shakyamuni Buddha all the way from India through China and Japan and have brought uh, the teachings to him. And so he praises these uh, seven masters and their teachings uh, for uh, everything that he understands. And so I, I think this is uh, I, I think this is no different than let's say your uh, your field is music and you love classical music. You know who are your seven masters in the in the music uh, tradition? You know maybe Beethoven, Mozart. Uh, if you're a musician, you you have been inspired. <laughs> to be a musician by the music of, of great, great uh, musicians and composers in the past. If you love basketball, you know, who are your seven masters in the, in the basketball tradition? Who are the greatest NBA players of all time that, that you think are the, the seven greatest that inspires you as a basketball player? You know, is it Jerry West? Is it, is it John Stockton? Is it, is it you know Magic uh, Magic Johnson or Michael Jordan or or you know who who are your seven masters as a basketball player? You know if you if you like to cook, you know is it Emerald? Is it uh, Gory Moto? Is you know, who is who who is your inspiration and who really has uh, brought that uh, tradition to you? And so uh, I think that uh, anyone in any field has their own kind of seven masters. And so in a sense, we as Shin Buddhists, we have to find you know, our own seven masters. These are the seven masters that Shin Nan Shoni encountered, and it's who he praises as his great teachers in his life. And so in a sense, we have to do the same. You know, who, who are our own great teachers that, that we uh, owe our lives to for having brought the, the Dharma to us? Maybe for some people, it might be uh, Rin Yoshoni. For uh, other people, one of the seven masters might be the Dalai Lama. It might be Thich Nhat Hanh. It might be uh, Great Zen Master Dogen. See, so it could be, it could be a variety of teachers. But we have to kind of put forth that effort. We have to seek the path, uh, read many different books, listen, hear many different teachers, and then we then these great teachers begin to emerge. Sometimes when we meet one teacher, it opens up the world to, to other teachers. You know, I had that great, great fortune of studying under Reverend Kubose, 
who is the author of the book Everyday Suchness. I always recommend that book as a good place for people to start if uh, they're new to Buddhism. And so uh, I was very inspired when I heard Reverend Kubo says speak at San Jose uh, Betsui when I was going to IBS. And I thought, gee, I would really like to study under this, this teacher, this, this minister. And so after I graduated from IBS, when I looked back on it, I thought, geez, the nerve of me. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I called Reverend Kubose up on the phone. I said, well, I know you don't really know me. I met you at San Jose, but I've always been impressed by your teachings. Uh, I would like to come and study under you. Would that be okay? <laughs> and he said, well, I guess so. <laughs> Why don't you come? And, and he says, I, you know, I... Uh, I don't have a place for you to live. I said, oh, no, don't worry about it. My wife has a, an uncle there that's going to let us live there, so don't worry about that. So we, we moved to Chicago, lived with our uncle, and spent you know nine months, some of the best months of my life, uh, there studying with River Kubose, just watching him, how he lived and worked as a minister. Uh, he would give a lot of his time to study with me. We we went through the Shoshinge together, line by line. We studied things like Sambutsuge, Juseige. Uh, we studied the 48 vows of the larger sutra. We went through each vow one by one. And so he would give a lot of his time to study with me. I would sometimes go with him when he would speak at different colleges and other places. And uh, sometimes he'd say, oh, I want to plant flowers in the garden today. So we would go out and we'd plant flowers, you know, so whatever it was that uh, 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 he needed to do that day, I, I would just watch and help out uh, in Chicago there. So, uh, you know, I met Reverend Kubose, and then his teacher was a teacher by the name of uh, the late Reverend Akegarasu. Garasu. First name is Haya. And he was a Shin Buddhist minister uh, of the Higashi Hongan tr tradition. Reverend Kubose was also ordained in the Higashi tradition. There's two major traditions of Shin Buddhism. One is Nishi Honganji, which this temple is connected with, which Orange County is connected with. That's the Buddhist churches of America. But there's also uh, Higashi Honganji, and there's about five temples in the United States. Reverend Kubose got his ordination in Higashi. Uh, but he, he built his own temple, and he, he wanted to make it sort of a non-denominational uh, temple of Buddhism. So his is not formally affiliated with Higashi Honganji, but his ordination comes from Higashi. So Reverend Kumosa studied under Reverend Akagasu, so I always wanted to, to read and learn from Reverend Akagasu because that was Reverend Kumosa's teacher. <laughs> So after I studied in Japan and got to where I could kind of read Japanese somewhat, I started reading you know, Reverend Akagrasu's writings. So his, his collected works, Reverend Akagrasu's uh, collected works, this much in Japanese. And then Reverend Akagrasu's uh, contemporaries, another great teacher, Soga Ryoji, Soga Sensei, his, his writings, this much. Kaneko Dae, another, another contemporary of his. His writings in Japanese, this much. D.T. Suzuki, people have read him in English. You have no idea how much in Japanese. In Japanese, D.T. Suzuki, my arm doesn't even reach that far. All of his writings in Japanese, oh. So there's so much that we still have yet to kind of introduce to the West. Wonderful, wonderful teachers. And so hopefully in time, uh, more of these wonderful teachers and their writings will get introduced. So meeting Reverend Kubose introduced, opened up this world of Reverend Akagrasu and his contemporary uh, teachers. And so more and more teachers kind of are opened up to you. And so uh, I pass it out today. We'll have, if we have a little time, we'll read a little excerpt from Reverend Akagrasu's lectures on the Shoshinge. So what I did in my class on the Shoshinge we would study it line by line, but I also translated a little bit at a time this Reverend Akagarasu's lectures on the Shoshinge. And uh, I think that, yeah, that you, you have that. So uh, as we would go through the Shoshinge, I would translate a uh, few pages of his commentary, and then we would use that as a, sort of our uh, sort of study, not a study guide, but we would read Reverend Akagarasu's commentary to help us understand 
those passages from the Shoshinge. And many places, his insight into the Shoshinge uh, really, uh, really was a tremendous help. So, uh, when you begin to encounter teachers, then the world of great teachers kind of opens up more and more teachers. The one thing unique in, in Shin Buddhism is that we, we don't really have any gurus in, in Shin Buddhism. If, if you encounter a teacher that says, you know, you should only listen to me, you should walk the other way. Because <laughs> great teachers in Shin Buddhism would all say, no, you should listen to this teacher, or that teacher, or that teacher. And, and, you know, gosh, you know, they would say, well, I'm just so-so, so you really should listen to, learn from these teachers. So the great teachers in Shin Buddhism are always sharing about their teachers and other teachers. And so Shinran Shonin too, when he encountered Honen, when he encountered Honen, other great teachers became sort of opened up to him too. Teachers that Honen liked to read, like uh, uh, Zendo and others. So anyway, I uh, just wanted to bring up that point before we go into the title. Okay, so now let's uh, go into the title of the Shoshinge. So the title Shoshinge is actually an abbreviation. And a lot of things in Buddhism gets kind of abbreviated, and sometimes it gets uh, uh, we miss something when we when we abbreviate it. So the Shoshinge is actually Sho Shin Nem Butsu Nem Butsu Nem Butsu. Well, I just write it as one. Shoshin Nem. Nem, well, right. Nem Butsu. Yeah. Shoshin Nem Butsu. Yeah. So, Shoshin Nem Butsu. Yeah. So, we're going to go into each. Uh, character, how to write it, but the full title is Shoshin Nem Butsu Ge. So Ge means Gatha or song, or we could even maybe even say poem, but more like Gatha. <clears throat> like uh, the Jews say Ge, Sam Butsu Ge, they're all Gathas or short poems that appear in this long sutra. Okay? So uh, that's the same character. So a gatha, he says, composed a gatha or poem on, on what? On true, this character means true. Uh, this shin is, is the abbreviation of shinjin, which is the sort of core of Shinran Shonin's spiritual uh, realization. In Zen, they talk about satori. In Shin Buddhism, we talk about shinjin. I think, uh, for now, just think of it as like your uh, true mind, true mind, true hearted mind. So true Shinjin and Nembutsu, Nembutsu, which is Namuami Dabutsu. So a song or a poem on true Shinjin and Nembutsu. So for Shinnan Shonin, these two are, are like two sides of the same coin. Shinjin and Nembutsu are deeply interconnected. There's no Shinjin without Nembutsu. And there's no true Nembutsu without Shinjin. So when we abbreviate it, when we just say Sho, sho Shin Ge, and we take out the Nembutsu, we kind of take out a very important part of this, of, of what he's trying to say. But over time, over the tradition, it just gets abbreviated, and everybody, instead of saying Sho Shin Nembutsu Ge, uh, they just started saying Sho Shin Ge, Sho Shin Ge for short. But we should understand that the full title is Sho Shin Nem Butsu Ge. And then there's a, actually another writing that Shinran Shonin has that's very similar to this, <coughs> and he titles that one Nem Butsu Sho Shin Ge. So he changes the order slightly, but he still keeps all these characters in the title. So the full title is Sho Shin Nem Butsu Ge. So let's learn these uh, characters one by one. So let's uh, start with Sho. 
<coughs> so this character has five strokes. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so let's write that together. One, two, three, four, five. Do it again. One, two, three, four, five. One more time. One, two, three, four, five. Now close your eyes and picture it and try to write it. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? Okay? So five strokes. Okay? So we do this in, in English, right? One, two, three, four, five. When we're trying to count things. This is what they used in the Asian tradition as a counter, because it's five strokes. So next time you go to a Chinese restaurant, watch the waiter as he's taking your order. Oh, we'll have uh, three orders of fried rice. Three, three fried rice. One, two, three. And then he writes, you know, fried rice. And we'll have two chow mein, two chow mein, and one, two chow mein, like that. That's how they, that's how they write it. Ten orders of gyoza. One, two, three, four, five, you know, you know what I mean? You know, right? <laughs> that's how, that's how they, that's how they, it's just like we do this, this, okay? So, this character means true, uh, it, it means, uh, it's the same character that's used in Eightfold Noble Path, the Hashodo, this show. Uh, so, true, it could be correct, it could be right. So, uh, basically, uh, true. Okay? The next character, Shin, is written this way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So when you write a box, it's always like this. One, two, three. Okay, so whenever you write a box. Okay, let's do that again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, now this character has two parts. And many of the Chinese characters have uh, different components to it, like a very elaborate character. And there's a core part of the character that's called the radical. The radical. Or it's like the root. The root of the character. So if you want to look up a character in the Chinese or kanji dictionary, you have to know what the radical is. The radical is. So sometimes it's the left hand side, sometimes it's the right hand side, sometimes it's the top of the character, sometimes it's the bottom of the character. <laughs> and it's kind of a guessing game, but uh, there, you have to just kind of gradually learn these radicals. So here, the radical is the left hand side. So this character, this means man. It's kind of like a, uh, it's kind of like, kind of like a stick man, you know? So this, this part means man, and the other part of character, so this is man, and the other part of the character is this. So this means like words. So this character means like trust, trust. See, so you, you trust in a man's words. You trust a person's words, and that's, that's the, the kind of basic meaning of this character. Trust or faith. You have you have faith in a man's words. You have trust in a person's words. So that's what this character means. Okay. So <clears throat> let's practice writing it one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So Sh Shigaragi Sensei, Professor Shigaragi, he dedicated his whole sort of research and study as a Shin Buddhist to what is the meaning of this? <laughs> what is the meaning of Shin in the Buddhist tradition? What did it mean from the Buddha's earliest times? What, is it, what did it mean to all the seven masters in their writings? He really dedicated his, his research to what does this mean? Because 
without understanding that, we can't understand what does it mean for, you know, Shinna Choni. And so he wrote a very lengthy work, uh, six, six, 600 pages or something, his uh, sort of accumulation of his research on what does Shin or Shinjin mean. And Reverend David Matsumoto has been translating this book. He's been working on it maybe over 10 years now, I think. Oh, wow. uh, but it's very close to uh, being, uh, being published. But it's, it's quite an accomplishment for Reverend Matsumoto, too, to translate this, this work by Professor Shigaragi. Okay, so true, true. So, so, you know, I prefer to kind of keep this in terms of Shin Jin. And some of the earlier Shin Buddhist writings translates it as faith. Uh, but faith can be a little bit misleading because it doesn't mean like uh, uh, blind faith. It doesn't mean kind of like, uh, well, I, you know, I have faith that, that it's not going to rain tomorrow. You know, you're not sure, but you kind of have faith. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe I have faith that the 49ers are going to win tomorrow. <laughs> but I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> I'm not absolutely sure. But it, it, has, um, it has a little bit more deeper meaning of that. It does have a meaning of faith, though, however, and in, in Buddhism, we all start out with faith. Buddhism starts out with, with a sense of faith, you know, let's, it's like a, a person, since Shigaraki Sensu used to always explain it this way, like a person is starting out on the Buddhist path, and it's like uh, walking into uh, water, first it's shallow, and as the, the further and further you go, the water gets deeper, Initially, our, our, our faith is kind of like, like this at the beginning. You, you have to have some kind of faith that, well, there's something in Buddhism mm -hmm. that I feel is, is of value, is of significance, I, I want to learn more about it. And so, you know, we, we, enter, we enter the path. And, and we're just learning sort of the, the beginning part of it, the surface understanding maybe, uh, the uh, more elementary understanding of it. But the farther we go, kind of the deeper, the deeper the water gets. And so our understanding too deepens. So Shinjin has this meaning of the initial stages of faith, but as we go deeper into the tradition, then for Shinan, Shinjin also means, it means, uh, uh, it has this meaning of truth, or it has a meaning of uh, realization, or even uh, awakening. So it might start out as the, the initial footsteps on the path, but it also has the meaning of coming to the deepest point, the deepest realization as well. So I kind of like to keep this Shin as Shin Jing. The, when they translated this collected works of Shinnan, they started this, gosh, maybe 20 years ago, maybe more than that. 20 or 25 years ago, they've been working uh, at the Hongarji Translation Center group, they had lots of debates on how to translate this. Do we keep it as Shinjin? Do you translate it as faith? How to translate it? And, and it was highly debated, but they decided to keep it in the, in the uh, original term. And so many terms are coming into this culture, culture now uh, as is. You know, you go to a sushi bar. People don't say sea urchin. I, I was in a sushi bar the other day, and this non-Asian guy goes, hey, how's the uni today, you know? <laughs> so people, people are, they're learning a lot of these terms just, just as is. You know? Tsunami. Huh? Tsunami. Oh, tsunami, yeah, tsunami, right, right, right. Uh, a lot of, lot of terms. Uh, so, uh, Xinjing might be one that, that we kind of maintain in the original until until we all have a better understanding of it in this culture, and then uh, different, different Shin Buddhists will kind of interpret it and explain it in their own unique manner. So true Shinjin, and now Nembutsu. So now you're going to learn how to write Nembutsu. Here you've been saying Nembutsu, maybe many of you, your whole life, so we're going to learn how to write Nembutsu. <coughs> so this character... Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, let's do that again. Maybe I should, can all be seen in the back? 
Maybe I should be writing it up here where it's higher. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this character as a whole means to to think on, to contemplate on. This is the character that they use to write mindfulness in the original Chinese. See, so mindfulness is something that's coming into this culture. They're, they're just kind of taking from Buddhism. This is, this is Buddhism. Mindfulness is Buddhism. Uh, in Idaho, I'm driving on the freeway, and this lighted traffic sign says, Be mindful of the other driver. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Buddhism has made the traffic signs in Idaho. But it's, it's really Buddhism, but, the, but our modern culture has really taken this mindful, mindfulness. You, UCLA has a mindfulness center. UC San Diego has a mindfulness center. The, at the university level, they're focusing on mindfulness and how it helps people in their lives you know, to, to learn about mindfulness. So we have, we have mindfulness. Nembutsu, at the core of Nembutsu is this character for mindfulness. But yet here in, in America, we haven't brought out how in Jodo Shinshu, really mindfulness is, is, is an integral part of Shin Buddha's teachings. It's, it's the Nen of Nembutsu. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really to be mindful of Buddha, Nembutsu, okay? So, can you explain the two parts? Oh, yes. So, so this character has two parts to it. As a whole, it means think on or contemplate on or to be mindful of. But the, uh, the way I, I actually learned the meaning of this character was from our, our own Reverend Miyagi, Reverend Akio Miyagi, the older brother of Reverend Nobu <coughs> Miyagi, who served here. He always says, you know, I'm the smarter, more handsome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was just a YBA kid. Reverend Miyagi was a, a minister in Seattle, and he did a calligraphy workshop at a, at a, at a conference. And so he showed us how to write Nembutsu, okay? Then so he says, well, Nembutsu has these parts. So first this part, one, two, three, four, plus this part together, okay? This, this means now, ima, this means now, and then this is heart, this is heart or kokoro, Carmela's uh, uh, center is, is called shin, right, You're using this shin, right, yes. so we mean, we mean character meaning heart, and then, and then butsu, buddha, so Reverend Miyagi said, so nembutsu means now, my heart, my heart and mind is one with Hearted mind of the Buddha. That's that's Nimbutsu. My hearted mind now. My hearted mind is one with hearted mind of, of the Buddha. Nimbutsu. Nimbutsu. It's a very beautiful way of of, of thinking of what Namu Amida Butsu means. What Nimbutsu means. So when we when we say Namu Amida Butsu, it brings our hearted mind to be one with hearted mind of the Buddha. So uh, Nim Nen or of Nimbutsu. Let's, let's practice writing again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So with this character, you, you, you look in the dictionary, maybe this is the radical, maybe this, just this part is the radical, you know, but uh, I think this is under Kokoro. Huh? <laughs> okay, so now you know how to write Nen of Nimbutsu. Can, can I just yeah. say one? We have a good friend who's a professor named Dr. Mark Blum. And he says it's his personal um, thing that he wants to do in his lifetime that we use men. men. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to change this to, to yeah. men. So he, he says, says it's a. Men. He hates the. <laughs> in English, we've been using nem. Yeah. N E M. 
And he says his personal quest is by the time he dies, he wants <laughs> Nim to be gone. So there's no more Nim. Uh, so, you know, this character by itself is, is pronounced Nin, but I think when people say it, it has this more of a Nin. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it got Romanized as, as an M. But really, Dr. Blum is right. It should be a Nin. I think it should be Nin. Nin. Uh, well, <laughs> Nin. 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 Yeah, it has a little bit of an M sound when you say it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, so Nen, or Nim, and now uh, let's learn the character for Buddha. Okay, this is a pretty simple character, right? Just one, two, the man radical, we already learned how to write half of it. One, two, three, four. So this is the simplified way of writing Buddha, okay? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Four. But this is a simplification of the, the classical way of writing it, is like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm. So in the uh, older text, this is how Buddha is written. And in modern text, it gets abbreviated this way. Now, I've always wondered, I've never found out exactly, but doesn't this character look, remind you of this character? <laughs> Some connection there somehow. I, I'm not sure what it is, but <laughs> I don't know. Buddha means give up money, or <laughs> okay. So then uh, Butsu, and then Ge Gatha Gatha. So in here, the first half of the character, you already know how to write. One, two, the man radical. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's one stroke. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, eleven. Atta Tadashi. I always have to ask sometimes Japanese speakers because sometimes I might have the order wrong. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you do this first and then that. I don't think you can do this and then that. So the show. Ko ko naka naka kara. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. So, I passed out this sheet. This sheet. So, if we were doing this course <laughs> weekly, I would give this as homework. <laughs> and I would say, you know, go home and practice writing each of these characters. You know, this, this many times. Fill in all the squares. You know, you're just watching TV, or instead of doing Sudoku, you know, show. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Write show, you know, 10, 20 times. And shin. So I have the stroke order, in case you maybe didn't quite miss all the stroke order. It has the stroke order, and then empty squares where you could practice under, under the, uh, on the top there, you could practice writing it. So. So when, when, when I did this Shoshinge course uh, the first time, we, we had worksheets like this every class, you know, five or six, or sometimes we would do enough to do like one line of the Shoshinge, so how to write each character in that line, and then they would have to practice uh, writing that character, and then the next week they would bring me their, their homework that they had actually practiced it. Uh, but, you know, they got to be kind of a fun thing, and... And as I said, uh, when they had spare time and just to just to practice that, you know, like John Turner even did it at work. You know, he's practicing this crunch at work, and so his boss comes around and quickly shuffles his papers. <laughs> so uh, now, in what? Not even in a, an hour and a half, but when we started on the Shoshinkia. It's only been about an hour. You you know how to write 
five characters. <laughs> five Chinese characters. Five characters. So in, in another week, we learn another five. Another week, you learn another five. And you just keep doing this week after week after week. Before you know it, you, you know five or six hundred characters. <laughs> yeah, or you know. <laughs> Some you actually did it in somebody. Oh, yeah. oh, mm -hmm. oh, you did you did a course like this. He copied your course exactly. Oh, oh so you <laughs> <are old. laughs> And some of you studied with uh, yes. Masami? Yes. Oh, and did you go through the whole? No. no. Oh, you, you're no. part way through. Stop. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Why did we stop? No commitment. No one was yeah. Coming back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to keep it up. That's it's hard to admit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Five, five characters per week will take you seven years to learn eight. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to work. We were learning uh, maybe, uh, maybe eight to ten. Eight to ten. Uh, new, uh, new characters each week, yeah. And then, well, then in the text itself, the characters then start repeating. Some of the characters wow. go, "Oh, we have that character," you know. So they're so happy when, yeah, you know, even two or three characters in in one line because it repeats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Any questions so far? Uh, what we covered in terms of the title? Yes. The word changing is. Uh, page realization yes. Of yes. yes. Oh, what what else does it mean? Uh, actually, there is a passage in in here where he talks about the meaning of this character, and he even he says things like it it means experience, you know, and uh, uh, it means uh, uh, truth. It means reality. It means, uh, I think he even uses the, the word uh, becoming. <laughs> becoming. It, becoming meaning it, it's, it's something always in process. So he, he has all these different meanings uh, of this character. That's why it's kind of difficult to just translate it as one thing, like faith. Because it has, for uh, Shunan Chun, it has kind of very, very deep meaning. But he's, he's pointing to... Uh, he's pointing to the true heart and mind, the true heart and mind of the Buddha that he receives into his heart and mind. Maybe go right Shinji so we can see what oh, Shinji okay. is. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so Shin and Jin. So this, this character that we've learned, which means like true or truth, and this character that means heart, Heart or mind, it's hard to translate. Yeah. Hard to translate kokoro as, as it could because you know your kokoro is kind of it's not just your mind, but it's not just your heart. Yeah. See, it's kind of like, uh, like almost like heart mind, mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe even your gut too. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, your, your kind of gut feeling too. So uh, that true heart and mind uh, is 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 what the characters mean. Okay. Kind of like your core, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you could say, yeah, yeah, the core. I mean, that would be another way, the core of one's being, maybe, even. Uh -huh. It's a very controversial word. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <coughs> so, one thing about reading these texts in the original like this, then you're not relying on someone's uh, translation. Because a translation is always an interpretation, too. Because you have to interpret that, that text to be able to translate it. And in some cases, you see, when we, when we even looked at it, uh, the translators, they would leave out something, or they would add in something that's not even there. So it's like, well, gee, well, why would they translate it that way? But when you kind of look at the, at least the original, uh, then you can kind of appreciate, the, uh, appreciate it in the original. And then also realize that yes, there's there's various translations. So when we studied this, we looked at what four different translations of the Shoshinge as we're going through it. There's the we, one was the collected works. Mm -hmm. Another is this uh, Inagaki Sensei's translation. Another is the D. T. Suzuki's translation. And the fourth one was the Dukoku, Dukoku University translation. So we we looked at all four of those. Every 
every class, each line, okay, the collected work says this, DT Suzuki says this. Mm -hmm. And so this is how we studied it. And one of the uh, one of the persons that took this class, and uh, one of our Sangha members, his name is Bob Bolander. So he, after we finished the course, he took all four of those versions, and then he kind of took parts of each one, and then he put it into his own words. And he made his own translation of the Shoshinge. You know, but he doesn't really read Chinese that well, you know, just after we studied it. But, but taking elements from each one, and then putting it into his own words, he made his own translation. It's, I gotta tell you, to me, it's the best English translation of the Shoshinke, because it's written now by a native English speaker, and uh, who kind of took took from all the translations and put it in his own <clears throat> words. I, as far as reading in English, it to me it reads reads the best. So uh, it's in. Uh, we published a new service book, so it's we have in there. Bob Bolander's sort of version of the Shoshinge. And then on top of that, what he did was he put it into, he made one version into a, a rhyming form so that each line kind of rhymes for people who want to read it as, as poetry. So he has that version as, as well. So, so he, you know, he spent hours and hours and hours trying to get the lines, you know, to rhyme. So uh, if, if you ever have a chance to look at our service book, uh, you could you see that. How oh, jeez. Yes. How do you spell his name? Uh, Bolander. Uh, Bob. <coughs> Bob. Bolander. We're going to be arguing by in Salt Lake. We're going to be purchasing um, oh, their new service, service for, right? yeah. to use it. Oh, oh service. Okay. So. Yeah. They don't. <laughs> Bob has, he has literally read everything in English, I think, on Buddhism and Jodo Shinshu. I'm mean, just astounded at what he's read. He's read the Pali Canon in, in English, the entire Pali Canon, the early Buddhist uh, uh, writings. That, uh, so he's just read so much, but a real humble guy and just still a student of the Dharma, uh, listening and... Uh, so anyway, it's great to have him in our, in our classes. Uh, you know, what I shared was this Reverend Akagrasu's commentary. Uh, I don't know if we, I don't want to start it and confuse people, but maybe it's, maybe it's better if, uh, rather than, you know, we don't have time to read it all, but you could read this uh, on your own. And so you get a little flavor of uh, Reverend Akagrasu's uh, uh, understanding of the Shoshinge and then how he uh, lectured on it. And, and then, uh, you know, I've translated, uh, it's sort of, kind of excerpts, it's not everything, but this is just one lecture that he gave at a temple on the Shoshinge. Okay. So let, let me just stop there to see if you have any questions or anything you'd like to talk about in in terms of what we covered so far, or anything at all in terms of your your study of uh, Buddhism and Jodo Shinshu. Uh. Yes. Who was the Higashi teacher who wrote December Fan? That's uh, his Kiyozawa. That was Akagarasu's teacher. So <coughs> Manshi Kiyozawa. He was a, a, a great Shin Buddhist minister and teacher who kind of, uh, in a sense, kind of revitalized or revolutionized Shin Buddhism. And uh, he had several great uh, students. Uh, one was the Soga Ryojin. Another was Kaneko Daiei. Another was uh, Akegarasu. Haya. And uh, so, you know, Re then Reverend Akagasu's students are people like Reverend Kubose. Uh, you've heard of this uh, Maida. You know, Dr. Haneda uh, translates writings of this Maida, Maida Shuichi. 
Uh, and so he was a student of River Dr. Gracias. And under Kobose is Harada. <laughs> <laughs> and then also uh, uh, Reverend Saito, Reverend Saito, uh, Yoko Saito. He served at uh, uh, Reverend Kobose's temple with Reverend Kobose. And then he, he, was, he went to Los Angeles. He was the Dean Bond of the temple there. He was also a student of Reverend Dr. Gracias. And Kyoza Manshi died. Really, really young. Yeah, yeah. 40s, wasn't he? Yeah, early forties. Right, early forties. Yeah. He was trying to kind of, kind of get back to what was the uh, Shakyamuni Buddha's fundamental spirit of Buddhism, and so he, he lived a very austere life. He read Shakyamuni Buddha's early writings, uh, but then at the same time, through that experience, came to appreciate Shinnan Shonin in a deep manner. Uh, he was the one who brought out the Tanisho as a popular Shin Buddhist work. Before Kiyozawa, nobody even knew about the Tanisho. But Kiyozawa made the Tanisho a, a very popular Shin Buddhist text to read for Nishi people and Higashi people. So, you know, I, I am fond of, of their writings, uh, not just because Reverend Kuwosa I studied under him, but I really feel like their way of talking about Shin Buddhism and interpreting Shin Buddhism is a way that the Westerner mm -hmm. is going to be more receptive to. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I think that, that uh, it's really imperative for us, if, if we're serving as a minister here in the West, that we should at least read these teachers and be familiar to some extent of the way they talk about uh, Shin Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think it, it's helpful for us uh, over here. Dr. Mark Blum has translated a number of these teachers' works mm -hmm. in in a collection in English called The Spirituality of... Yeah, it just came out recently, not, not too long ago, but it's available at the BCA bookstore. Yeah. But he's, he's got essays from Kiyozawa, you know, Soga, Kaneko, uh, some of these great teachers. And these great teachers were all called, at one time or another, they were called heretical, even by the Higashi Honga tradition, because it was, it was kind of a very radical way of talking about Shin Buddhism. <clears throat> They used Western philosophy a lot too, which was uh -huh. a new thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did they get hold of that Western philosophy? Germany uh, and Japan had a lot of close ties, right? Mm -hmm. Even from the war. And so a lot of the German philosophers had connections to Japan. So there are a lot of their works. These, a lot of these guys read German. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before English. Before right. They read English, yeah. yeah. Was Ger German yeah. was a big language for them, so. Mm -hmm. Hey. The Japanese word for part-time job is Arbeit. Arubaito? Oh, 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 yeah. yeah. Straight out of Germany. Oh, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But hey. now, we're, we're fortunate because English is quickly becoming one of the main works for Buddhist studies. Uh -huh. So we have a lot. We're, we're getting a lot now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.